All right, thanks, Bob. Uh, as Bob suggested, we are talking about some new tools, and we are talking about floor aeration tonight. It's a specific tool that I want to get a chance to talk a bit about it and sort of prime the pump for the conversation we're about to have with the panel. So, tonight we're going to do a little bit of intro. I'm going to do this short conversation, a short presentation on FAR, and then we want to have this panel discussion and then a lot of time for questions, as Bob has suggested. We're happy you all come out. We want to tease some conversation out of you and elevate the discourse as we come into a summer on the center plan that's going to include talking about some pretty specific regulations. Uh, to answer some questions that may be hanging in your minds, tonight is not a consultation on specifics, but the consultation on the specifics will happen through the summer as we work on developing regulations. Right now we've got a whole team working on that inside our offices, carrying from the work we did last year on policy and policy direction. So we've got the ability to talk about regulations this summer, and tonight and events like this are about elevating that, that discourse and education so that when we get to discussing regulations, we all are starting with a pretty good understanding of why we regulate and what we're trying to do. So tonight, uh, Community Design Advisory Committee, they are our advisors on how to run the process of developing the center plan, and they asked us to do more of this education so that people wouldn't be out there with no proper information or proper time to consider the regulations. And with a new tool like FAR, we think introducing it through a conversation like this before we drop a bunch of regulations on your plate are probably a good way to, to prime the pump. And then again, as Bob suggested, we want to have educational sessions and conversation with our community that aren't about specific developments or in response to a problem in our community so that we can, again, just build the discourse between municipal staff, the community at large, and the development community. So when we control development, many people in this room are in the industry and are aware of how we control development. We use maximum height, that's the term we use. As Bob suggested, we have a complicated regulatory structure. We don't measure height the same way everywhere. In fact, we seem to measure height differently all over the place, depending on uh, really the energy or the, the ideas about height for a specific community at any given time. So we have lots of different ways to measure height, but height control is a way to regulate and control development. We use angle controls. Most of the reason we use angle controls is to protect sight, uh, sunlight and sky view for people on the public streets, but in some cases for neighboring properties too. So our R3 zone currently uses a lot of angle controls and overall height, but another tool they use is something called people per acre. So in our, in our zones right now, in Halifax and Dartmouth, uh, we try to estimate how many people might live in a building uh, by how many people we think might live in a two bedroom unit. And then we multiply that out for all the units and set density limits as well. So for most of the peninsula, we actually have 125 people per acre as a density limit. So it's another control that we use. All of these are currently in place. So the height control, the angle control, the people per acre, and sometimes in our development agreements, we get away from people per acre and we go to the units because it's a little easier to count on the plans and a little easier to understand. So we even do unit control sometimes as well as other areas. And finally, we have setbacks all over the place. This is a common regulatory tool, a side yard setback, a rear yard setback, a front yard setback. We have minimums and maximums, and these are things that we do to try to control where a building sits on a site. So we layer these on top of one another right now in our zones and regulations, and we get a pretty controlled site, uh, but pretty complicated to understand. In fact, uh, many of you who are consultants in the room may often get a call from a landowner just to determine what they could do on a potential site that they might buy. So our, our regulatory structure is so complicated in the city that you as a landowner often have to hire someone to help you understand the regulations so you understand what your land may be worth. It's actually incredibly complicated. One of the things that we want to talk about tonight is simplifying that. So floor area ratio is, is a tool that we can use to control building mass without identifying each of those setbacks and heights and angle controls, but still control the overall mass of a building. Uh, what it tries to measure is uh, the allowable buildable floor area of the structure, and they relate that to the size of the lot it's on. So, we measure floor area ratio by assessing the gross floor area of a building, and then we divide that by the total lot area. In, in calculating floor area ratio, what is very particular is actually what gets included and what doesn't. So your access chute, your, your stair access, your elevator, uh, those don't get counted in most FAR calculations, 
And where you start the measure is really important too. Uh, you want to start that measure from the inside of an outside wall rather than starting from the outside dimension. We don't want to make our measures of density control actually prohibitive for people that want to insulate their building better, for example, or use a higher quality wall structure. So we want to measure from the inside of an outside wall. We want to not include elevator shafts and access stairs. We want to make sure that the things that, that aren't fundamental to how the building uh, is perceived outside are included. But some cities have gotten really clever or, uh, or slick with this, and they start to not include things they want to incentivize. So one of the things you can do in measuring floor area ratio is say, your amenity spaces don't count. Right? So you don't, you know, if you want to do nicer amenity space, I don't want to penalize you on your buildable for that. So we can incentivize in a soft way certain types uh, of, of uses inside a building by not including them inside the FAR. And in municipalities where FAR has been used as a design control for a long time, they're getting that clever with the eventual controls. So the building that's shown up here on a, a 10 meter wide by 10 meter wide uh, hypothetical site is one story, covers the whole site, FAR of one. A building that's half that size but goes two stories, still an FAR of one. So even though each individual floor plate is, is, is half the size of that ground floor, when you add up the total floor area, it adds up to the same as the first one. You divide it by the lot area, you still have an FAR of one. And the same if you use a quarter of your lot, and you have a quarter of each lot in each floor plate, you end up building up four floors, but you still have an FAR of one. So FAR controls total volume, but it doesn't necessarily uh, care where that volume is placed on the site. So sometimes you have to add in additional regulations to make sure that it works. Uh, we wanted to show a couple larger buildings, just showing that an FAR can be achieved of three, perhaps on this site, with or without a podium. But on a 50 meter by 20 meter site, you can see both of these buildings, although they hit the ground in different ways, would have the same floor area ratio. Canadian cities, including Vancouver, Calgary, St. John, Toronto, they all implemented FAR within their zoning regulations uh, for mixed use areas and for large multis. And a quick snapshot of Halifax, uh, 5552 K Street, where the Starbucks is across from the Hyperstone. Uh, 2651 Winter Street, where the Sobeys is, and the Maritime Center at the foot of Spring Garden Road. Just some quick calculations on those. Uh, the K Street property has an FAR of 4.4, the Winter Street Sobeys has an FAR of 0.2, and the Maritime Center downtown has an FAR of 9.5. So those are just snapshots for the numbers to put in your mind as you think about FAR on the site. So there's lots of other examples, uh, but those are three that we thought everyone would be familiar with in this room. So some of the benefits. Uh, so FAR is this bulk control, or this mass control. But it doesn't, again, care as much about where that is on the site. So it allows for flexible design. Structures can be better designed to fit their context on an individual site. So the building can flex a bit. It can do different things based on its neighbors. And that, that does tend to lead to more context sensitive design. Uh, we think the look and feel of the neighborhood can be improved as each design is site specific, the structures can be better scaled to existing neighborhoods, even though we overlay the FAR tool as a, as a top-down tool for the whole say, regional center, we're still gonna see variation along our corridors and streets where people take different options on their land to build different sorts of buildings. We don't want a monotonous city that has the same thing built on every block. We don't want every new development to look the same. And by controlling FAR rather than our angle controls or our wedding cake setbacks in downtown Halifax, we can end up allowing people a little more creativity in design. And finally, uh, we think this makes the whole system a little simpler. As I suggested earlier, overlaying a lot of different controls can make it really complicated to understand what's allowable on a piece of land. FAR is a total bulk control. If it's clear about what's included and what is not, makes it really easy to understand what might be happening on a site you're purchasing or a site that's on your street. You have a really good sense of what's going to happen because the volume of the building is a simple multiplication from your land area. So you've got that really simple way to think about it. It's also really simple to do density bonuses. In downtown Halifax, before you know how much you're going to have to contribute to the density bonusing structure, you've got the whole building design. Because you don't know until you've done the design how many floors are above that post-bonus height, or pre-bonus height, and what the square, area, square meter area is. 
Whereas in FAR, if you bonus on FAR and the first 3.5 are crew bonus and 0.5 more density after that is post bonus, it's again that easy math, one multiplication to tell you what you'll be contributing. It lets everyone have a better understanding of what's going on in the city and what value of contribution the density bonusing system might bring to a neighborhood where we're making change. So, there is this wonderful tool that the Center for Urban Pedagogy, that's a, or CUP, has created in New York City. It's uh, cup.org. They have a website called whatisfar.org. New York started using FAR in 1950 uh, as a control, and, and, and it's, they've been a real, uh, I guess, uh, one of the first pioneers to really expand on using it for all kinds of uses, including industrial. Um, so this public group in New York, the Center for Urban Pedagogy, created this What is FAR tool. It's actually kind of fun to play with. Uh, and you can stay up to date with our projects as we move forward at halifax.ca slash planning, centerplan.ca, or at the Twitter handle that we're using a bit more these days. So that's as much of a presentation I wanted to do, uh, just to set the stage for that. Um, yeah, so I'll hand it back to Bob. Thanks, Jacob. All right, so we'll get our lucky panelists up. Needed breath. <laughs> All right, so uh, what I thought I would do is uh, just overall your, your first impression. So I think uh, you all come from a little bit different backgrounds, different, different experiences. And uh, so if you could just talk a little bit about some of your initial thoughts on FIR. Of course, it's one type of design control. Uh, you know, how you see it working with some others, how it might be different. Uh, and, and just how, what do you think would be some advantages or some concerns right off the top of this with going to an FAR type, type of thing? Um, well, and I'll try to keep it brief. I'll try to keep it brief, but um, the one thing that I find promising about FAR, hopefully, is that as during the, uh, the preamble, it's, the hope is that it's going to greatly simplify the process and, and start to reduce what currently is a very, very, very prescriptive methodology for trying to design buildings. And, and that's true with all the various bylaws across the city. It's true with the relatively new downtown bylaws, um, which seem to continue to get increasingly complicated with each improvement. Um, so I think a simplification is definitely required if you know i think there's a lot of potential using far as long as it doesn't get further complicated with all these other additive types of, of requirements that and, and that's my fear is that far might be a good kind of starting point but then if it continues to get layered and layered and layered with other prescriptive requirements then we're going to sort of be right back to where we are today so I think the devil's ultimately in the details, so it'll be, we're all going to be interested in participating in how those details get written. Um, I'm going to also try to be brief, so I think I'd kind of take that question at two angles. The first is that it's a promising way to look at density in a different way and uh, look at promoting creativity in the way that we build density in our city. And then the second uh, thing that I'll say is that, you know, this presents a really good opportunity for creating not just better downtown communities, but also creating better suburban communities that um, cater to other sorts of transportation that we're, that we're trying to encourage in our suburban communities. And, and I know that that doesn't, the two things don't necessarily correlate on, at face value, but when you um, actually look at the kind of buildings that have FARs that are above 1.5, anywhere ranging anywhere to five or six, um, you end up having better, more tighter knit, uh, more walkable communities than than you do in places with low FARs. So, um, so yeah, I think it's an encouraging tool, and I think it's something that uh, I I'm excited about. But I would also echo that you know while while we don't want to be too prescriptive, it does need to be. It can't be a standalone tool, and it does need to be coupled with other things that can help to promote the sorts of design that we want and the sorts of streetscapes that we want. Oh, never mind. It's on. Hi, Jenny. Um, I'm Anna. I don't know if, um, if, oh, if yeah. everybody knows. Jenny, sorry. Hi. <laughs> um, 
So I, I certainly echo the comments about um, about simplifying things um, and uh, and certainly allowing for greater design flexibility. Should there not be the additional um, uh, restrictions, there do have to be some, um, but. Um, it was mentioned in my introduction that I, I was previously on the design review committee and certainly there were some plans that we would sit down with the week before reviewing and, and I would question why things, why things happened because uh, certain decisions didn't seem to necessarily respond to um, one's environment and ultimately it came down to an angle of control or, or potentially a, a, a step back or, or, or a step back that was there. So I think in some cases those didn't necessarily um, respond to a uh, neighborhood or environment the way that they could. Um, I'll move it on over to, to you, Jacob. Oh. Thanks, Anna. Uh, I am Jacob, and just to respond a bit to what Anna said, you know, when you write regulation, one thing that happens in Nova Scotia is that we have to have policy written and adopted at roughly the same time as the regulation. And that's because we want to know why those regulations are being written. In the case of downtown Halifax, all the step backs that we have as you go up the side of a building were meant to allow sun to penetrate and not to increase too much shade as we build new buildings. But we want to make sure, again, do they actually achieve that goal? And is every regulation that we've written headed towards some policy objective that we heard from the community as important? So again, making sure we only layer in enough regulation to protect what matters to the community and not double and triple and, and, and repeat the same control again and again. And in some cases, things are controlled in building code and we're then even going in and doing additional control in our land use bylaws. So just being very um, uh, uh, economical in how we use regulation rather than using it as the first tool. Well, it's a good, a good way to get started here, I think. Um, <clears throat> I think from a regulatory perspective, what uh, often comes up is this discussion around flexible certainty, right? We want to know exactly what we can do and we want to have everything flexible. You know, so FAR obviously sets certain parameters. Uh, they, they aren't, to Jacob's uh, presentation, they're talking about exactly what goes where. It gives you some flexibility. And I think often when we're, we're talking about building design and we're talking about a, a a specific site. We're, we're talking about those characteristics of the influence of the design. We're also, uh, and underlying that is an economic conversation. So, you know, I want you to, to think a little bit about how having that uh, as, um, if you like, kind of a, an established amount of, of front uh, can help define the, uh, the design process. Well, I mean, Having a predictable process in and of itself uh, creates greater economic certainty. You know, the lack right now, I mean, if we talk, want to talk about economics, and right now the lack of uncertainty in the approvals process has economic risk. Um, so if we can reduce risk, then we can create greater economic certainty. I mean, the, the other part of economics is how much can you build? Um, because obviously that's really important to developers when they're developing their pro formas. They need to know, you know, what's what's the what's the opportunity, and and how's that going to potentially be profitable. So, you know how, you know what there's going to what the magic number is in FAR is going to be a critical decision point, and I would anticipate that that number is going to vary depending on what part of the city we're talking about whether it's in a corridor, or whether it's in a center, or whether it's in a great more residential zone. So there's going to be a variety of what they are, depending on what those circumstances are. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, one thing I just wondered to myself, and I tried to imagine what developers might be thinking about this, and I was mentioning to, the, to this to you earlier, is that, you know, what, what process would they maybe rather see, and I can't speak on their behalf, but this is just my own speculation, is, you know, under the current regime right now, if they want to go through a development agreement, they can ask for whatever they want to ask. And it's all subject to whether they get approval or they negotiate and ultimately they get approval. There's uncertainty with that, but generally, you know, the ask is usually substantial and, you know, where they end up is, is to be determined. FAR will create certainty, but then will that give a developer as much as they think they could 
under the current regime going through development agreement process. So I think that, that's going to be an interesting, I think, I think we definitely need to reach out to the development community to get, and I'm sure that's happening already, but we need to talk to them about what they think is how this process might compare to the process that they're currently undergoing, because even though a DA might take a year, year and a half, if they can get considerably more than they might get through an FAR, then you know the economics of that might, in their mind, be, well, I'd rather wait a year and a half and get more. So I think there, there has to be a balance that gets us uh, determined when FARs are established so that it works for everybody. It works for the public, works for us as designers and architects, works for developers because they're the ones that ultimately are making the investment and taking on the greatest amount of risk. So to move, that was a really, really thorough answer, so I'm not going to echo. No, 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 I'm not going to echo that is all I'm saying. Um, to move a little bit beyond the direct um, economic benefits for the developer or for whoever's involved in the development, um, in my experience, cities that use FAR as a regulatory tool tend to have buildings that are more innovative and where more creativity is being used at the site plan level and also at the level of designing the building at the architectural level. And you know, these things you can directly correlate to the to how welcoming a certain neighborhood or a certain site is to promote economic activity in that area. So if you're using FAR as a tool and therefore encouraging this sort of innovation, it can actually, you know, contribute positively to the to the economic well being of the entire community or of just the neighborhood that's around that city. So yeah. Nope. So, I, um, Jacob and Bob, you can speak to this, but I would also imagine if it's similar, it would speed things up, and we all know that that, that time is money. I know you, you did touch on the gross floor area, um, and so I know that there's certainly a calculation that needs to be done, and the simpler that is, the easier that that calculation would have to be. But um, you know, the simpler anything is, then uh, the the quicker things will go through through the process. And um, you know, developers, of course, are are um, working with. Um, um, consultants, and you mentioned sometimes even before they, they buy lots to to analyze um, what what they could could put on there, and so some of some of those things I think would be economically beneficial. You might want to follow up. On. Yeah, I'd love to. I think just even in preparing for tonight, thinking about all the costs a, a developer incurs from site acquisition or even prior to site acquisition, you know, our local architects and planning consultants are are wonderful, but they're not cheap. And in our, in our applications process, some of our developers are telling us they're incurring up to six figures in costs before they even know that they've got that approval. So, you know, as Eugene has said, there's a lot of risk involved because you don't know what your eventual development is, but also the cost to get there is, is really uh, high in the city sometimes, compared, depending on what we're asking the development community to do before they come in and have a... Uh, <coughs> Uh, a complete application package, right? That, that, that process between municipal staff and design consultants to get a complete application process can sometimes take months of time and energy and dollars and, and simplifying that we think will benefit everyone because we'll get a complete application a lot sooner and it will cost us a lot less to get to that point of consideration. Well, those are uh, really good responses. I think there's a, there's a lot of things that I think as has come up here, we talk about the, uh, this is one component <clears throat> of, of the overall system. So when you think about or the regulatory approach, you know, it, it is trying to capture density. We're really talking about the intensity of use on the site, and it's, it's kind of a proxy for some of the things that we've talked about uh, previously or in other pieces. So we're talking about units, or we're talking about, you know, other ways to capture really the intensity in terms of services and kind of the demand on things for the community. So, you know, it is still going to give us a way to talk about that intensity. What are some of the other things that we want to talk about when we're looking at sites, uh, site design and, and really to get the kind of outcomes we're talking about? Because I think FAR won't be it. I mean, there's other things that need to go on there. But what, what are some of the other key things if we're going to be successful in using this as a regulatory piece? Need to be in the system, need to be uh, not too complex. Uh, but what are some of the, the other things you need to use in tandem with an FAR? Um, well, you know, for sure there's going to have to be other um, drivers in addition to FAR. You know, and I think 
you know, Hyde is an obvious one. You know, Halifax obviously is a city uh, where Hyde is always a topic of conversation. Um, so I would, I could imagine that, because, you know, like some of those diagrams that Jacob was showing on the screen, even though they were very rudimentary, they start to illustrate how if a site is large enough, then if you just put your building on a smaller portion of it, the FAR could potentially result in a fairly tall building, um, as opposed to where you're covering more and you're, and you're not as high. So, you know, you'd have to have a large piece of land to be able to create something quite tall, but nonetheless, that's a potential outcome. So I think having some kind of height, um, uh, I hate to use the word maximum, but, you know, some kind of height requirement is probably going to make a certain amount of sense. And again, that's going to vary depending on where it's located. Um, other things that might, that are worth consideration are things like, you know, a certain amount of lot coverage, for example. You might prescribe, you know, you need to have a, maybe, for example, you know, you got to have 80% lot coverage on a site. So again, that's going to result in, in making sure that the buildings have a certain relationship to the street and a certain relationship to the, to the boundaries around it. Um, and, and, but then, you know, but then you get into the ideas of, of bonus, uh, not bonus density, but bonus FAR, and then, you know, how might that start to impact um, additional height, depending on what that public benefit may be, whether it's affordable housing, art, public, open space, etc. But I could see, you know, just off the top of my head, I think height and lot coverage are two kind of obvious things that might create some additional requirement. Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly echo that. And then I may also just add um, the orientation of a building on a site can do a lot to uh, influence how the space around the site is used. And so if you've got, you know, front facing buildings that have a certain amount of front lot frontage coverage, you then have a street wall that is at least in an urban setting that's more welcoming to pedestrians and that people would rather spend their time in. Um, and then, you know, we looked at we looked at that diagram that showed an FAR, I think it was 1.0, and that four-story building could could generally be, you know, one, one can be considered a fairly good FAR depending on the context that you're in. However, if that if it ends up being that stacked four-story building, what are you doing with the rest of the site? What are you how, what are you using that for? And so we do need to think about the way that we're using uh, land around these buildings, and whether we're using that for surface parking, whether we're using that to create open public space, and you know if we are using it for things like surface parking, um, depending on the context again, where is that located? And is that located in front of the building, or is the building located at the street on the street level? So um, yeah, I think that just being really, really cognizant of what the site looks like and what the context is and what sort of environment you're trying to encourage around a building. Um, these sorts of things can not, not necessarily be prohibitive, but can help to encourage better, uh, better site planning and better building. You guys covered a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll use it, um, depending on, on how things change throughout the, throughout the process. We, we do see that a lot. After you get your site plan approval, then you go off into your detailed construction drawings and you might need to come back and ask for an amendment to your site plan approval because something changed. Uh, I think what I want to mention and think about the other regulations is, you know, we are really quite occupied right now thinking about the way a building hits the street. That public right of way is that public life. It's where our citizens live next to private development. And that interface is so important to us. But many of you may be familiar with other planning processes in HRM. We've written an urban forest master plan and set targets for tree coverage in our, in our municipality and in the peninsula that are very uh, ambitious. And that means we have to be really careful what we do in the rear yards. And that's not just for corridor buildings that have an FAR of three or four and you know, 60 to 100 units in a building, but also as we add density to the rear yards of residential homes, through garden suites or secondary suites or extensions to buildings, making sure that we're not losing all of that tree canopy because when you look at the oblique aerials of Halifax in the summer and you see a lot of our, our corridors and our residential communities covered in, in very mature trees, those trees don't live in the public right of way. Most of those trees live in our backyards 
and on our corridors. That means making sure we have appropriate rear yard setbacks as well as those front yard setbacks that, you know, pulling the building close to the street is really good for urban life on the streets, but it's also really good for the urban forest that lives in the rear yard. So we're, we're taking into account both sides of that when we try to draft up these regulations so that we get buildings uh, that don't have that un un unexpected impact on our urban forest as we're trying to add, add density to the core. Yeah, and if I can maybe add, I mean, you can't, you can't regulate good design, no matter how simple or complicated you make the regulations. Um, you know, on the one hand, I love the idea of keeping it incredibly simple because as an architect that has to design within these regulations, I want to have as much flexibility as I possibly can. And, and I know that my clients would like us to have as much flexibility as we can. But, you know, we also have, um, we do have sort of a professional obligation to do good design and, and, and I, but we still have to be, and I'm not suggesting that, you know, we just give us carte blanche to do whatever we think is right. I think we still need to be held accountable. <clears throat> Our clients need to be held accountable. As architects, we need to be held accountable. And I think that's where things like the design review committee work really well. I think it can work a lot better. They, we have them now for the downtown. I don't think it's being used quite right yet. And, and, and I, I think they should be engaged earlier on. I think they should actually have a bit more uh, empowerment and not just be going through checklists to see if you're doing this, that, and the other thing. But um, I think if we keep regulations a lot simpler and we have things like <coughs> design review committees that are comprised of the right type of people who have a certain amount of authority, then we can actually, then that is a way that we can be creative but at the same time, we can be held accountable. And then I think that's where the process can really start to sing. So I think often a comment that we'll hear through the process is, is what, we, what we want is, is better design. And you know, that, what does that mean? <laughs> often for different people, it means different things. Uh, and I think to, to your point, I mean, you can't regulate everything and you don't want to. Uh, the, there's certainly things we have to put in place to make sure that we're regulating in a way that inspires that um, uh, better design, the aspirational buildings, the things we really do want to see. But also, you know, not, not everyone is uh, coming in with the best designs. So we want to make sure that at the minimum we're getting some of the outcomes that we, we absolutely do need to have uh, on a regular basis, still in a simple way as possible. Well. Um, so what would be some of the, the risks, I think, in, in terms of going to FAR? I think one of the things we need to use this process to is to talk more about <clears throat> what the regulations mean, because it's certainly a concern to the community uh, what kind of outcomes we're getting. So I think FAR is an easier way to communicate some of those things. I mean, we're, I think everybody up here has got a, a fairly um, sensitive involvement with, with design. Um, so is that an easier or tougher way to communicate uh, some of the things we're trying to achieve by, by using FAR? Or is it a different kind of conversation you need to have where FAR isn't as public a part of the conversation? I'll let somebody else start this yeah. time. Well, I guess one of the risks of FAR could be that if a lot of the other restrictions are, um, or, or guidelines, things, rules, are maintained and then you throw an FAR on top of that um, that is maybe significantly lower than if you were to build that shape within the angle controls and setbacks, um, then you might be looking at a significantly uh, smaller building and we, and we know that ec development still needs to be economical so, so people might push their developments else, elsewhere. So I mean I think that FAR plus a lot of other rules gets risky. I mean, we, they still need to be there. Don't get don't get me wrong. But if if, if we're, we're we're building our wedding cakes and then working FAR into that at a much smaller uh, um, massing, maybe so, so adding on to our existing framework probably yeah, isn't going to help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. To add to that, I think that if you want to use like in terms of using FAR, if you want to use FAR in the urban center, you really need to push it out into the suburban centers and the suburban areas because otherwise, as Anna was saying, you know, if you're if you're putting more restriction and if you're discouraging certain sorts of development in the urban center and then kind of not discouraging not sorry, not discouraging them outside of the center, then you run the risk of having those developments that can't happen in the center being pushed out into the suburbs, which is not necessarily where they would belong. Um, so yeah, I think like a uniformity across 
the suburban and the center is a really, really important uh, tool to encouraging, um, not necessarily uniformity, but encouraging um, cognizance when we are planning for different contexts and uh, for for what we want in those different contexts. So, I, but but to that extent, you know, you did say, um, is there anything positive in terms of public perception? And I think that FAR can sometimes be a little bit more if if people are given the proper understanding of it, and if it's explained to people in the proper context, then I think that it can uh, be a little bit less scary than thinking about certain other restrictions like height restrictions which sometimes people think like oh my god a 20-story building is allowed here when when you're actually thinking about FAR it it doesn't necessarily prescribe exactly what's going to be there it gives a, a oftentimes a suite of options for people to choose from that may actually happen on that site so it's not just going to be you know a box in the sky which I think freaks some people out in terms of public perception. Jacob do you have any uh comment on this one, and then I think what I'll do is then uh, uh, ask if people want to ask some questions from the floor for, uh, for anybody on the panel or, or for people as a group. I mean, as far as risks of, of any regulatory structure, I think over-regulation is the biggest risk. So as, uh, as Anna pointed out, we can't just throw this at it and keep all the other controls. Uh, I think the other risk is, uh, you know, when we're introducing a new table on a large scale, it would be perhaps missing the impacts, like maybe not, uh, you know, as a community, uh, missing some of the impacts over rolling this out and, and in, in a large project like the center plan, so we're very aware of is, and it's why we're taking time to talk through every step to make sure that the staff team hasn't missed something and making sure that we're aware of it. We don't um, take a very thick marker and draw a line around parts of the regional center and make an unexpected change uh, that we didn't think was going to happen. And so being aware of the magnitude of the change we're putting in place. I think, if I can just add, I think we have to get over our fear of height. I know I mentioned height earlier, but I think we really got to get over it as a city. Um, heights, not, we shouldn't be afraid of it. Um, I think um, it has its place and it can work really, I mean, Vancouver is a great example, right? Um, it's a very dense city. Um, there's a lot of height. Um, and it works really well. There's great, um, but it's all about what is the, uh, what's the experience at the street? What's the pedestrian experience over those first few floors? If the upper floors are set back at a certain distance, then your perception and, and, and things are, are separated, towers are separated by a certain amount, mm -hmm. then light gets in. Your perception from the street of how tall a building is above those first few floors is, is almost inconsequential. So we need to rethink height in Halifax. Um, but one last thing I, w I might suggest is that, I mean, FAR, I know we're kind of focused on FAR tonight, maybe a little too much so, but it's a very kind of vague concept in a way. And I think for a lot of people, it's a, little, it's a bit difficult to comprehend, especially when we just see very oversimplified diagrams of it. Um, we almost need to, I think maybe what the city needs to do is actually almost do some case studies or some test cases. Look at some specific sites in the city where there might be development opportunity and test it out. Theoretically test it out. Um, and, and test it out at different FARs and see what possible outcomes might actually be. And, and share those with the, with the community so that people can actually get a better sense of what that might mean and how it might mean if it was kept low, if it was higher, if it was an FAR of three as opposed to four as opposed to five. What does that actually mean? Because this is a city where every site is different. Every neighborhood is different, but there's just something about the nature of our city where every project that we do, even if it's in the downtown or along Gottagen or somewhere, every site has its own idiosyncrasies and they all need very different um, solutions to them. So I think somehow we need to better um, illustrate and share with what FAR could actually represent. So I'll just chime in and then I'll let Jacob say something. <laughs> so we definitely have heard the height conversation once or twice, uh, but, uh, but we, what I'd say is Halifax is a very uh, idiosyncratic, very individualized uh, so the sites are very different, you're, you're absolutely correct. 
And um, that's one of the things that I think is really valuable about Telfax. And often with the critique that comes up of some of the new designs is, well, that's not as different as the previous structure, or you know, we're looking for, for that difference. You know, so how do you, how do you achieve that? Um, but I think this is, this is part of that conversation, sort of how you get that balance between uh, that, uh, that individuality, that, that expression, because you certainly have to respond to the, the individual sites. Uh, JP. Uh, there are a couple points I want to make, just like we, we, we need to know what we value so we can regulate and control it and give that flexibility so that each individual site can have its own design. That should be the best, the best redevelopment or the best development for any individual site. In some cases, the best development for some of our sites is already there right now. But on the ones that are being redeveloped, we want to make sure that we get good design. I want to take a second to mention there is an event happening next week with our colleagues from Westwood and A49 and WSB working together to hold a public meeting about different designs for a site on Roby Street. It used to be Crookshank's Funeral Home, uh, I believe, at, right across from the Commons. They're holding an event on the, the 5th. Jeffrey, is that correct? June 6th, and we have invites. There. June 6th, and there's invites here. So I just wanted the chance to say that. And like Eugene says, every site is specific, and you've got uh, a local builder is looking at different ways to, to move the mass around a site for two different or three different very types of buildings, so very different types of buildings. So I want to hope that everyone has the opportunity to see that if, they're, if they want to. I think it's at the Lord Nelson on, on the 6th. Very cool. Thanks, Steve. So, okay.